Hi, so you just finished taking your college algebra test um, in class, and I want you to pull out your written work and grade your exam, and then upload it to Canvas. And so the first problem is worth eight points, and it says solve the following system of equations using matrices. When you came into class, I told you that it's to start with matrices, but that you could stop when it got ugly. And so let's do that. So let's write this in matrix form. All the X's are lined up, the Y value terms are lined up, and the Z terms are lined up. And so our first row is one, negative two, one. So put a vertical line, equals, and then 15. Second row is three, one, negative three, negative eight. And our third row is negative two, four, negative one, and negative 27. So working with matrices, we want to work from column to column. Working with the first column, we have the one where we want it. And so we're going to use this row, not change it, but we're going to use it to get rid of the entries below. And so I noticed that if we take negative 3 times row 1 and add it to row 2, changing row 2, that would get rid of our 3 here, which we want to do. I'm going to rewrite row 1, 1, negative 2, 1, and 15. And then I'm going to change my row 2. So I'm looking at negative 3 times 1 plus 3 gives me 0. Negative 3 times this negative 2 is positive 6 plus 1 gives me 7. Negative 3 times this 1 is negative 3 plus this negative 3 gives us negative 6. And negative 3 times 15 is negative 45 minus 8, so that's negative 53. So now looking at the third row, we want to make the entry where the negative 2 is, third row, first column, a 0. We're using row 1 again to do that. So if we take 2 times row 1 and add it to row 3 to get our new row 3. So 2 times 1 is negative um, 2, minus 2 gives us 0. 2 times negative 2 is negative 4, plus this 4 down here is 0. 2 times 1 is 2. 2 minus 1 gives us 1 here. And then we have 2 times 15 is 30, and 30 minus 27 is 3. Right there, I would stop. Looking at the bottom row, we know what z is. So here, this tells me that z is equal to 3. The second row tells me that 7y minus 6z is equal to negative 53. So we can go in there and we can substitute in what z is to solve for y. So doing back substitution, we have 7y minus 6 times z, which is 3 equals negative 53. So we have 7y, this is minus 18, equals negative 53. If we add 18 to both sides of the equation, we get 7y equals, well, negative 53 plus 18 is a negative 35. Divide both sides by 7, we get y is negative 5. So now knowing what y is, what z is, we can go to our first row, rewrite that as an equation. So this first row can, or it doesn't really matter, they're the same thing, is x minus 2y um, plus z is equal to 15. So I'm just going to go in and I'm going to substitute what y is. We said y was negative 5. And z, let's substitute in what z is, which is 3. So now we have an equation with just x left in there, and so we can solve for x. We have x, so negative 2 times negative 5, so plus 10, plus 3, equals 15. So x plus 13 equals 15. Subtract 13 on both sides, we get x is negative 2. Not negative 2, positive 2. So the solution to this matrix 
or systems of equation, okay, is the point two, negative five, comma three. So you can always check your solution by going back and substituting it into each equation and showing that you get a true statement. It has to work for all the equations in the system in order to be a solution. So number two, part A, we're given a system of inequalities, three X squared plus Y squared is less than or equal to 12 and y squared is less than or equal to 9x. Part A wants us to graph this system of inequalities, and this problem is gonna be worth six points. Just the part A is worth six points. I can tell that the first, I'm gonna look at it as an equation, 3x squared plus y squared equals 12. This to me is an ellipse because we have both of these are the same sign in front of the x squared, y squared, but not the same number. If they had been opposite signs, it would have been a hyperbola. If they would have been the exact coefficient in front of the x squared, y squared, we would have had a circle. We are not in quite standard form. We have to set this equal to one. So let's divide every single term on each side of the equation by one. We get x squared all over four plus y squared all over 12 is equal to one. So I know this is an ellipse again. My center is zero, zero. And I can tell that it's elongated the, um, with a major axis is parallel to the y axis because the bigger number, the 12 is underneath the y term. And so I know that it's gonna be looking like this. So let's just graph a little bit of what we have. Center zero, zero. Um, my a squared value is equal to 12. So I know a is equal to root 12, which is the same thing as two root three, which approximately is 3.5. So we're gonna go up 3.5 about. We're gonna go down 3.5. And then my b value, well b squared is equal to four. So b is equal to two. So to get the points on the vertices on the minor axis. We're gonna go over to the left two from the center and to the right two from the center. And so we have this ellipse. Then we wanna graph the second inequality. And before we graph this, let's just put a note to ourselves because this is an inequality where we're gonna shade. And so it's less than or equal to, so we wanna shade inside. If you're not sure where to shade, choose a point that is not on the graph and test it to see if it's a true statement. So zero, zero is not in the graph. This is the area I think I'm gonna shade. If I plug in zero for X, is that a true statement? And zero for Y. I get zero plus zero is less than or equal to 12, which is true. So we shaded the right region. Looking at the second equation, we have y squared is less than or equal to 9x. So let's just look at it as an equal sign and graph the, that equation. I notice that this is a parabola. It's the y that's squared and not the x that's squared. So my parabola is gonna be this shape. My vertex, is at zero, zero. And it tells me that I wanna graph everything that's less than or equal to. So we needed to determine, and I'm believing it's inside this parabola shape, if that's true. So choose a point that's not on the graph of y squared equals 9x. So how about let's try 1, 0. So if we plug in 1 for x and 0 for y, do we get a true statement? So is 0 squared, is this truly less than or equal to 9 times 1? Yeah, 0 is less than or equal to 9. And so we are shading the right region. So the solution 
it's going to be where they overlap. And so it's going to be this piece in here. So part B asks us to find the points of intersection. for the two curves. This one is also worth six points. So total for number two is 12 points altogether. And this one, this is like, it's a system of nonlinear inequalities. We have three X squared plus Y squared equals 12. We wanna know when is this intersecting the graph y squared equals 9x. Let's go ahead and do direct substitution. We know what y squared is from the second equation, which is 9x. Let's go back into the first equation and substitute y squared in. So we have 3x squared plus, instead of writing y squared, I'm going to write it as 9x, is equal to 12. So now we have, no, it should have been in, 3x squared plus 9x equals 12. So now we have looking at that type of equation. Now we only have one variable. It's a quadratic equation. So solving quadratic equations, we want to set this equal to 0. So we have 3x squared plus 9x minus 12 equals 0. I notice that there's a 3 in common with all of those terms. Let's factor that out. Factoring out the three, we get three times the quantity x squared plus three x minus four. This is equal to zero. And then I notice that also factors. And so looking at this, two numbers that multiply to negative four but add to a positive three is plus four minus one. So that factors as the quantity x plus four times the quantity x minus one. And don't forget about the three there. And so now looking at this, we factored it completely, set each factor equal to zero. Well, three is never equal to zero. X plus four is zero when X is negative four. And X minus one is zero when X is one. Just looking at my graph, I can see that this is not intersecting at X equals negative four. Um, so let's look at when X is one. We can plug it into either one of these equations to solve for Y. So let's plug it into the second one. We had that equation y squared equals 9x. So when x equals 1, let's plug it in there for x. We get y squared is equal to 9 times 1. So y squared equals 9. Let's take the square root of both sides. So we get y is equal to plus or minus the square root of 9, which is 3. So the points of intersection are going to be when x is 1, y is 3, and when x is 1, y is negative 3. So now let's just look at, because maybe we didn't graph this and we didn't know what was going to happen when x was negative 4. So let's go back into the second equation and let's plug in x is negative 4 into this equation and see what's happening. So we have y squared equals 9 times x, which is negative 4, we get y squared then is equal to negative 36. When we take the square root of both sides, though, this is not a real number. This is an imaginary number. y is equal to plus or minus 6i. Not real. So it's not intersecting there. So the point of intersections is 1, 3, and 1, negative 3. So again, that's worth 6 points for part B, 6 points for part A. 12 points total. Problem number three is worth 10 points. It says find the partial fraction decomposition for x minus three all over the quantity of x plus two times that quantity of x plus one quantity squared. 
So depending on how the factors are in our denominator depends on how we're going to set this up. First thing that you want to look at is to see that this is a proper fraction so we don't have to go and do long division, which it is because the degree of the numerator is smaller than the degree of the denominator. And so now looking at this, we have x minus 3 all over, well x plus 2 is a linear factor and it only appears once. So we're going to rewrite on the other side, this is equal to a alt over the linear factor of x plus 2. Plus, now we go to the next factor, that is also linear, x plus 1, but it appears more than once. So we need to write um, b all over one of the factors of x plus 1, plus c all over the factor of x plus 1 quantity squared. We would continue in this manner if this had been a higher exponent than 2. So for instance, if that was to the fifth power, I would have five different fractions increasing my power each time until I got to the number of factors I had. Then we want to go through and we clear the fractions by multiplying through by our LCD. So our LCD in this case is x plus 2 all times x plus 1 quantity squared. So we're going to clear the fractions by multiplying that on both sides of our equation, and we can do that because it is an equation. So when we multiply by the LCD on the left-hand side, we're just left with a numerator, x minus 3. This is equal to a times, well, when we multiply this first fraction on the right-hand side by our LCD, the x plus 2s cancel, leaving you with a x plus 1 quantity squared. plus b, when we multiply our LCD by b, um, we're just going to be left with one of our x plus 1s and the x plus 2. So we're left with x plus 1 times x plus 2, plus c. So when we distribute this last fraction on the right hand side by x plus 1 quantity squared times x plus 2. The x plus 1 quantity squares cancel and you're left with the x plus 2. So let's simplify by distributing on the right hand side. So we have x minus 3 is equal to a all times well, if we FOIL out x plus 1 times x plus 1, we would get x squared plus 2x plus 1 plus b. If we distributed out x plus 1 times the quantity x plus 2, we would get back x squared plus 3x plus 2 plus c times the quantity x plus 2. So now let's go and distribute those capital letters inside the parentheses. We get x minus 3 is equal to ax squared plus 2ax plus a plus, now distributing our b, we have bx squared plus 3bx plus 2b. And now distributing our c, we have cx plus 2c. So this is where we looked at the coefficient in front of um, the like terms and set them equal to each other. So notice there's no x squared term on the left hand side. So the coefficient in front of the x squared term is 0. So we can think of this if we want it as 0x squared plus. So we have 0 is equal to all the coefficients a plus b in front of the x squared terms. Now we're going to do the same thing. So the coefficient in front of x on the left is 1. This is equal to, so looking at all the terms with just an x on it, the coefficient in front of the x here is 2a um, plus 3b plus C.
And then constants, we have a negative 3 on the left is equal to a plus 2b plus 2c. So we have a systems of equations and we want to solve for a, b, and c. It doesn't matter, I didn't tell you which way to do it. I'm going to do it at using a matrix. So we have, I'm going to write coefficients in front of my variables on the left and then the equal on the right. So I have 1, 1, there's no c value, so 0, 0. I have 2, 3, 1 equals 1. I have 1, 2, 2 equals negative 3. So working column to column, I am working with my first column using the one where I want it um, to get rid of the numbers below. So to do that, let's look at negative 2, row 1 plus row 2. I'm going to rewrite my row 1 because I'm just using it to change it. I'm not changing this row. So if I look at negative 2 times 1 is negative 2 plus this 2 is 0. Negative 2 times 1 is negative 2 plus 3 is 1. Negative 2 times 0 is 0 plus 1 is 1. Negative 2 times 0 is 0 plus 1 is 1. So now let's go and get rid of this 1 in the third row, first column. So we're looking at negative row 1 plus row 3. So negative 1 plus 1 is 0. Negative 1 plus 2 is 1. Negative 1 times 0 is 0. Plus 2 is 2. Negative 1 times 0 is 0. Minus 3 is negative 3. So now we're going to move to our second column. We have 1 in the entry we want it. And so now we're going to use our second row to get rid of the entries above and below that leading one. So technically, I'm keeping row 2. I'm going to rewrite it, 0, 1, 1, 1. And I'm changing my row 1 and row 3. So if I look at negative row 2 plus row 1, well, negative 1 times 0 is 0 plus 1 is 1. Negative 1 times 1 is negative 1 plus this 1 is 0. Negative 1 times 1 is negative 1 plus 0 is negative 1. Negative 1 times 1 is negative 1 plus 0 is negative 1. Same idea, negative row 2 plus row 3. So 0 times anything is 0 plus 0 is 0. Negative 1 times 1 is negative 1 plus 1 is 0. Negative 1 times 1 is negative 1 plus 2 is 1. And negative 1 times 1 is negative 1 minus 3 is negative 4. So I already know I can stop here, or I notice I can just move to my column to make this look like the identity matrix on the left and use this 1 to get rid of the entries above. So I'm just going to do that. So I'm going to look at row 3 plus row 1. Row 3 is staying the same. My row 1, 0 plus 1 is 1, 0 plus 0 is 0, 1 minus 1 is 0, negative 4 minus 1 is negative 5. And now I'm going to look at negative row 3 plus row 2. So anything times 0 is 0, plus 0 is 0. 0 times anything is 0, plus 1 is 1. So this is now negative 1 times 1 is negative 1, plus 1 is 0. And negative 1 times negative 4 is positive 4, plus 1 is 5. So reading this off, I can tell that A is equal to negative 5. B is equal to 5, and C is equal to negative 4. We're almost there. We want to go back up here, and we want to rewrite this rational expression. Now we know what A, B, and C are. 
So we have negative 5 all over x plus 2 plus b. b was positive 5 all over x plus 1 plus c. But c is a negative 4. I'm just going to pull the negative out front. It doesn't matter if you left it in the numerator and put a plus sign in front of that fraction, you're okay. So minus 4 all over my quantity x plus 1 quantity squared. Partial fraction decomposition, you should have gotten this answer. And again, that is worth 10 points. So number four has two parts. Part A is worth four points. Part B is worth one point. You're given an arithmetic sequence. You're given the first three terms, two square roots of five, 4 square roots of 5, and then 6 square roots of 5, and you want to find the formula for the nth term. Well, it's given us that it's an arithmetic sequence, and so we know a couple of things about our arithmetic sequence. We know a sub n, one way to write the formula is the first term, plus n minus 1 all times d. Looking at this, I can tell what my a sub 1 is. My first term is 2 root 5. I need to figure out what d is, but it's arithmetic. And since it's arithmetic, that tells me that one term minus a term right before it is going to equal d. So if I look at my second term minus my first term, I would get d. Or I can look at my third term minus my second. So I have 4 root 5 minus 2 root 5 is equal to these are like terms, same number underneath the radical, so 4 minus 2, so this is 2 root 5. So we get d is equal to 2 root 5. So now I'm going to plug in my d value and my a sub 1 value into a sub n to get my formula. And so a sub n is equal to the first term, 2 root 5, plus n minus 1 all times d, which is 2 root 5. If we go through and we simplify and we distribute this 2 root 5 to the n and that negative 1, notice we have a 2 root 5 minus a 2 root 5, so that is going to cancel. And we get that a sub n is equal to 2 root 5 times n. So if you're not sure, you could always test it by plugging in values. So when n is 1, we get 1 times 2 root 5. That works. When n is 2, we have 2 root 5 times 2. Well, that's 4 root 5. It works. 3, 3 times 2 is 6, 6 root 5. So that is worth 4 points. Part B, we want to find the 95th term. Well, the 95th term is when n is 95. So we have a sub 95 is 2 root 5 all times 95. So 2 times 95 is 190. 190 root 5. So that was worth one point. Go ahead and give yourself the full credit. Even if you didn't have this formula right, but you went through and you put in the right thing and got the right value. So one more problem with some multiple parts. Well, I was mistaken when I said one more problem. Um, so there's one more problem, number five, and then there's another problem with multiple point parts. Um, number five, there's only one part, and that one is worth five points. You're given that a sub n is a geometric sequence, and a sub 3 is 1 third, and a sub 6 is 1 over 81. Find the formula for a sub n. So again, because we're given what type of sequences it is, we know some things. Since it's geometric, I know geometric sequences. a sub n is equal to the first term 
all times r raised to the n minus 1 power. So let's go through. We basically have two equations, two unknowns. We know that when n is 3, we have 1 third. So a sub 3 is equal to 1 third, which is equal to our first term, a sub 1, all times r to the n minus 1. Well, in this case, n is 3. And so we would have 3 minus 1 power. Or we can say that we have 1 third is equal to a sub 1 times r squared. So we want to do the same thing now with a sub 6 to get another equation. So we have a sub 6, n is 6 in this case, is equal to 1 over 81, which is equal to the first term, a sub 1, all r raised to the n is 6 again, 6 minus 1 power. So we have another equation, 1, eight, 1 over 81 is equal to a sub 1 r to the fifth power. Okay, so one way that we can solve, I notice if we divide both of these equations, So if I divide 1 third by what's on the other side, 1 over 81 is equal to, and I divide this a sub 1 r squared divided by what was on the other side over here, a sub 1 r to the fifth. So, so fraction divided by a fraction, same thing as 1 third times the reciprocal of the denominator, which is 81, is equal to, well, a sub 1's cancel, Rules of exponents, my exponent in the denominator is larger, and so we can, same base, we can subtract. This would give me an r cubed in the denominator. So I notice that 3 goes into 81 evenly, 27 times, is equal to 1 over r cubed. Let's clear our fraction, multiply both sides by r cubed. We have 27 r cubed equals 1. Divide by 27, we get r cubed equals 1 over 27. Take the cubed root of both sides. Well, the cubed root of r cubed is r, and the cubed root of 1 over 27, well, we could break that up as the cubed root of the numerator, which is 1, all over the cubed root of the denominator, which is 3. So we now figured out that r is 1 third. We now need to figure out what a sub 1 is. Go back to one of our equations. I'm going to pull the first one. And we're going to go in and we're going to plug in what r is and solve for a sub 1. So I get 1 third is equal to a sub 1 all times r, but we just said that r was 1 third, quantity squared. So 1 third equals a sub 1. 1 third quantity squared is 1 ninth. Let's clear this by multiplying both sides of our equation by 9. 9 divided by 3 is 3 is equal to our first term, a sub 1. So knowing what r is, knowing what a sub 1 is, we know what our a sub n formula is. And a sub n is equal to the first term, 3, all times r, which is 1 third, raised to the n minus 1 power. So that one was worth five points. Now the last problem. So this last problem, the total points is worth 10. First part is worth three points. Second part is worth two points. And the last part, C, is worth five points. So for f of x equals 2 raised to the quantity x minus 2 in that quantity, um, minus 4, answer the following question. So what transformations are being made to the graph of y equals 2 to the x to get the graph of f of x? Well, I notice we have an x minus 2 here in the, or in the exponent. That minus 2, this is affecting this horizontal shift, and it's going to make it go opposite. So it's going to be shift to the right, two units. And then this minus 4 in here, 
this is like y minus 4. And so this is affecting my y value. This is shifting it vertically. And it's going to do the same thing that it says. So this is down 4 units. So what is the range of f of x? Well, if I had y equals 2 to the x, my range here is um, from 0 to infinity. But I shifted everything down 4 units. And so my new asymptote, which was here at y equals 0, is now down at negative 4. And so my range is going to be from negative 4 not including, to infinity. Or you could have stated it as y is greater than or greater than, not equal to, negative 4. The last one, we want to find the inverse. So when we were finding the inverse of a one-to-one -one function, we first rewrote our f of x if it was in function notation as y. So we have y is equal to 2x raised 2 raised to the x minus 2 power, and then minus 4. Then we swapped our x and y, so we have x is equal to 2 raised to the y minus 2 power minus 4. And we want to solve for y. So let's isolate the term that has the y in it. Let's add 4 to both sides. We have x plus 4 is equal to 2 raised to the y minus 2 power. So let's take the log or natural log of both sides of the equation. Doesn't matter. So log of x plus 4 equals log of 2 raised to the y minus 2 power. Whole point of this was so I can use properties of logs to get that variable out of the exponent. And the property of log says we can bring this down. So we have y minus 2, put parentheses around that whole thing. Um, times log of 2. We want y by itself. We could distribute this log of 2. It's basically just some constant, coefficient, some number, whatever we raise 10 to, whatever exponent we raise 10 to get to. So we have log of x plus 4 equals y times log of 2 minus 2 log of 2. We want the term with y just by itself, so let's add 2 log of 2 on both sides of our equation. And so we have log of x plus 4 plus 2 log of 2 is equal to y times log of 2. Divide both sides by log of 2, we get y by itself y is equal to our inverse function, f inverse of x, and that is equal to, our numerator is log of x plus 4 in that quantity plus 2 log of 2 divided by well, um, log of 2. So part C, that is worth five points. If you have used natural log instead of um, log base 10, that's okay. Actually, log of any base would have worked as long as it's the same base. So I want you to go through, sum up how many points you got for each problem, and put that score on the top of your test. Scan it into the Canvas assignment for this. The test was out of 50 points. And I will see you guys at your final on Thursday next week. Take care.